What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of our X-Bars, uh, which actually ended up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. P90X founder, Tony Horton, who talked about how he made money as a street mime, and that's how he paid his rent and food money. Um, talked to Nolan Bushnell about when he was Steve Jobs' mentor that Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, who uh, coincidentally, Richard Armstrong knows his dad for from 50 years ago, I think, um, which is funny. But we, our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. Um, and we do that through a done-for-you VIP event service where we partner with um, large conferences and software companies. We have a done for you podcast service. So basically you show up, you do your thought leadership and interview and we do everything else to make it happen and go live and a done for you lead generation service. Um, we have a greater mission behind what we do, which is um, a veteran entrepreneur scholarship. So um, we will sponsor the at TNC. We actually sponsored um, a veteran entrepreneur to come to our VIP reception. We sponsor the flight hotel they're all expense paid trip and a ticket to the conference. Um, and so if you know of a veteran entrepreneur or you are one, you can apply to any future event, um, rise25.com slash mission. And this is interesting. Um, I have three amazing guests today um, who are some of the top direct response marketers, Brian Kurtz, John Carlton, and Richard Armstrong. And um, first I will introduce, um, <clears throat> it's hard to you know, John, like you said, say, well, I'll make a surprise because part of it is, well, I navigated to the who the hell is John Carlton page. And um, so introducing John, he um, is often referred to as the most ripped off writer on the web. Other marketers have called him the most respected writing teacher alive. And the list of well-known marketers who reference his work and also him as a mentor is, is pretty amazing. Uh, Rich Sheffrin, Evan Pagan, Frank Kerr, and Mike Phil Same, just to mention a few. And he's worked closely with direct response giants like Jay Abraham and Gary Halbert for years and was really a pioneer in online marketing. I was just watching his interview where Tony Robbins interviewed John on um, his methods, essentially. And he has a simple writing system. You can go to simplewritingsystem.com. He also has two volumes of the Entrepreneur's Guide to Getting Your Shit Together. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing from John and Brian Kurtz. Um, Brian, I think, you know, the introduction for you is just one of the most uh, generous human beings on the planet. I think everyone would agree with that. Um, he helped build Boardroom into, at its height, was a $150 million company. He's overseen the mailing of over 1.3 billion pieces of direct mail over the past, you know, several decades and has worked alongside some of the top people in direct marketing. Um, and he runs a group, several groups, uh, of top marketers called Titans Group. He's the author of Over Deliver, which is build a business for a lifetime playing the long game in direct response marketing. Um, and he's got some amazing bonuses there. And finally, Richard Armstrong is one of the nation's leading freelance direct response copywriters. He was voted AWA Copywriter of the Year. He's won several awards, the Capels Award, which is like the Oscars of direct mail. And he's also authored several books, God Doesn't Shoot Craps, which was fantastic, and the Don Con. And he has a shorter version which is how to talk anybody into anything, which is the persuasion secrets of the world's greatest con artists. Um, and it's funny, I looked on Amazon on this, Richard, and um, the people who bought the Don Con also bought Over Deliver and also bought The Entrepreneur's Guide to Getting Your Shit Together, Volume 2, on yeah. Amazon. Probably so, not a coincidence. So, yeah, so thank you guys for uh, joining. Um, great to be here. Um, so I figured we would discuss each of your books, um, successively, but, um, I wanted to start off and it's, it's interesting whenever I ask the question about big lessons learned and if I phrase it as regrets, people don't want to answer the question. And when people, when I phrase it as lessons, people will answer the question. 
Um, but I wanted John to start with you since we just met um, and I was listening to your Tony Robbins interview and you have an interesting, uh, I don't know if it's a regret or lesson uh, about that revolves around Jimi Hendrix. Oh yeah. I wonder if you uh, talk about that for a second. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not sure what the context of it was in the Tony Robbins interview. I never so listened. It was Kevin to Rogers. It was Kevin Rogers. You were Kevin talking Rogers. about Kevin Rogers. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I never listened to my stuff or watch my videos. So I'm not sure what the specific one, but, but basically the lesson for me was as a 19 year old, uh, I lived in Southern California, excuse me. And uh, Jimi Hendrix came to, um, the um uh well actually there's two stories that was it was it about my friend or was it about me it was about oh, you okay so the one about my friend is actually better it was the same it was the same tour that Jimi hendrix was on and i missed the show yeah that was the and, one yeah yeah so and um it, it, something really important came up for me when i was 19 years old and i didn't go see one of my guitar idols because something was so important that I didn't go see the show. Jimmy died very soon after that. And to this day, I regret not going to see the show. And I have no fucking clue what was so important that I couldn't haul my ass out to, to San Bernardino to swing auditorium to see the, the one guy I wanted to see at that time. It, it was, and, and it, 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 it just drove home the fact that, um, you know, not only is your life short, but everyone else's life can be very short. It can be shut off in a, in a blink. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, it, it, was, it was a very, very, very important lesson. It was one of the first big lessons I learned in when I was 19 years old. The other one being that I had been a reticent teenager and didn't really understand what was going on in life. And I just walked around thinking everybody, all these adults I'm around, have all these secrets about how to live a great life and they weren't telling me anything. And around 19, I started to realize, no, they weren't withholding their thoughts from me. They just weren't thinking about anything at all. Uh, <laughs> and that was a huge revelation. It was like, wow, am I in this minority where I'm constantly thinking about things? I was an empath. I didn't even know what that was for another 15 or 20 years. And so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of things, but there are, I think the thing about Jimi Hendrix, there are lessons that I'm still learning from when I was a kid, uh, when I was five years old from, you know, when I first started being conscious, I, I'm still, that's why my newsletters and my books, I always go over, I like to use personal anecdotes to begin the lesson because it happened to me. I'm the butt of the joke. I, I always screwed it up, but then I went back and I tried to fix it and I, you know, steeled myself to do better the next time. So. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing. That was what I, exactly what I was referring to okay. is that you do, I remember you saying this, it was with Kevin when you said like, I don't even remember what was so important that I didn't make the show, you yeah. know, probably a girl, but you know what? Don't remember her name. Nothing happened, you know, and <laughs> wow. Um, thanks for sharing now, that. Now Brian. All sad. <laughs> so Brian, what about you? Um, big lesson or regret or, um, you know, something that you would go back and tell your, uh, 30 year old self. You know, I don't, I don't have that many regrets. Um, but I definitely, um, uh, I think that, uh, gosh, I think, I think it's, it's, um, not not feeling like to spend all the time that I spend feeling guilty or or um not thinking about I mean as John said everybody else isn't thinking I, I get I guess the regret is not spending enough time with um people who have the wisdom um I I, I did spend a lot of time um in my early days with the old timers and people would make fun of me, you know, that you're spending all this time with these old people. And I would, I would stop doing it when they did that. And then I, I, after, after a little while I said, well, why am I not spending more time with them? Cause they have all the wisdom. And so the, that was the, the benefit. But then the, the, the regret is that most of them are dead now. And so like when, when someone said, 
you know, write your book, Brian, and call it too many of my mentors are dead. Um, <laughs> it was, it was kind of, you know, it, 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 it shook me a little bit, but then I said, I think I, I think it was the right decision, but now the regret is that a lot of the people that I learned from are gone. But I think, you know, when I was 20 and 25 years old and I was hanging out with people who were 60 and 70, I really, I realize now that that was a, an incredible lesson and that I never should have listened to anybody when they told me that, you know, go spend time with people your own age. And, um, and now, you know, now that I'm 60, I'm hoping that there'll be a 20 year old that'll spend time with me. And then when I kick it, you know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll remember me also. So I guess that's the, the one I'll stay. I'll, what I'll about, go. you know, like, and I know John just talked about, you know, with life is short, right. And whether it's us or people around us, um, I wonder your thoughts on, you know, um, and you, you have a quote, I'm a, butcher it, but uh, be busy when death comes knocking. Something yeah. Like that. Um, what would, do you do anything differently thinking about that? Yeah. No, you know, I, 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 Marty Edelston, who was my mentor and, you know, one of those older people who now is dead, Great uh, guy. used to say life is long, not life is short. Hmm. And the concept is that you only got one life. So if you treat it as long, as opposed to short, it's not that don't you don't want to do that so that you, you know, as John says, you know, you delay joy and you delay things that you want. But when life is long, you've got, you know, the ability to work everything in. And so I think having, uh, you know, talking about life is long. And then as far as, you know, when death comes knocking, be busy is is really important because. I really believe that, you know, death will come over to you. He's going to like look at you and say, yeah, this guy's too busy. I, I, and he'll move on to somebody who's a lot easier. And um, it's worked so far for me. And I think it's worked for a lot of people I know. And I'll stick with that as far as, you know, and, and being busy means be up to some, something big. So life is long and be up to something big. You combine those two things you'll never be unhappy. You know, you'll always be living into, you know, something a bigger, something bigger in the future. Uh, Richard, what about you? What uh, big lesson or maybe well, a regret you, you learned from and changed? Um, thanks for putting me last so that I could think of something. Exactly. I really yeah, appreciate it. I had some, so much of a delay, I couldn't think of something. I, uh, <laughs> You know, I've seen a number of your interviews over the years, uh, Jeremy, and um, when you ask this, I know you ask this question almost every time, and since you brought it up, uh, I remember you trying to ask Richard Vigory, and Richard, you, I'm sure you recall this, Jeremy, he absolutely refused to answer this question. <laughs> I think you asked him, you were very persistent, I think you asked him three or four times, and and he was even more persistent. He refused to answer it three or four times. And uh, finally, you just uh, decided to interview the, uh, end the interview. And the reason he refused to answer it is because he, and this is so typical of Richard, he's just always looking ahead, never looking back. He's like 80, what is he now, Brian? 88 or something like he's that? 80, yeah. No, he's 80. Yeah, 84, 85, yeah. Yeah, and he's just always looking ahead, moving, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And um, uh, I, I wish I could be like that, but I, I'm not. I do have some regrets. One of them involves Richard Vigory in the sense that uh, when people ask me uh, what I should do, what they should do to become a freelance copywriter, I always say, I'm going to tell you something that you don't want to hear, and that is go get a job. Get a real job with a good agency or a good company and uh, learn, learn the business that way. And I did have a job in an agency, but the truth is it wasn't a very good agency. I mean, I wrote one letter and they decided to make me the creative director. Uh, we were a very small outfit and we weren't particularly uh, talented. And uh, when I left that agency, I really needed more of that kind of education. I should have tried to get a, a, a job with Richard Vigory, 
who was the best at what, what I was doing at that time, which was political fundraising, or even better, I should have gotten a job with Tom Phillips, who used to work uh, for Richard and then went off and started a newsletter business that became, you know, next to Boardroom, next to Agora, probably the biggest newsletter business of all time. That would have been ideal if I just spent a few more years there learning from people who really knew what the hell they were doing uh, instead of immediately going off as a freelancer. And I have to say that's still affecting me somewhat today because I didn't get as good an education as some of my peers did. Uh, and then to add a, a simple pecuniary one at the end here as a second regret is that I didn't get into royalty-based copywriting early enough. I was a flat fee copywriter until, gosh, maybe, I don't know, less than 10 years ago. And uh, that, uh, that would have made me a lot more money if I'd gotten into it as early as, uh, as Gary Bensabenga did, for example. Was he considered, who was considered kind of the, the pioneer of that? Uh, Rutz, I'd say. Yeah, I'd say Rutz. Um, yeah, I'd say Rutz. You remember, Brian, you remember John Francis Ty? I do. Used to call himself the world's second most successful freelancer, the first being Bill Jamie. Yeah, I do know that. I, I, I didn't know him well, but I knew of him. Well, he had a column for Direct Marketing Magazine, and he was, you know, very well known. And uh, um, he was the first, I knew him personally, he was, the, he was the first person I knew who said, you know, we all should be working on a royalty basis. But then I met a, a mutual client. And uh, uh, I said, well, uh, somehow the topic of John Francis Ty came up. And, and the client said to me, he was in the office the other day, and you wouldn't believe what proposition he made to me. He said, he said I should pay him for every piece nailed. And I just <laughs> laughed him right out of here. Yeah. So I, I thought, well, it must be a ridiculous idea if my clients think it's a ridiculous idea. Unfortunately, John Francis Ty was not quite able to sell it back then, and that was – that was maybe early to mid eighties. Uh, I, I would think the people that, uh, that uh, John and Brian just mentioned, Brian Kurtz, I mean, uh, I mean uh, Jim Rutz and uh, Ben Tavenga was very early on, mm -hmm. maybe a handful of others. They were the ones who made it work. And the way, the way they made it work is that they were just indispensable. Well, they I'm also cool. had great clients too, who like Brian talks about that, that recognized the value of the writer. It actually Absolutely. did not, the, the best thing Brian ever talked about was happily writing those big checks that were more than anyone else was right. in the boardroom. And Gene Schwartz was getting paid in, in mailing lists. Yeah, I used to pay, uh, I used to pay Gene Schwartz in, in names. But yeah. the, the, the other thing about Ben Savanga and Rutz in particular is right at the beginning when they were doing royalties, they kind of realized that they were, I, I guess when you know you're the best, it, it, it helps. And so I don't know what, what, what Teague, you know, how he, how he stacked up, you know, as far as how good he was, but Rutz and Ben Savenga said, no, you know what, let's go to our, let's go to these clients and just don't charge them anything. So we didn't charge them and it was just on royalty. And then once they established themselves as royalty writers, then the line was out the door because they were beating everybody. And then they said, oh, you know what? We'll charge $30,000 in a royalty. So right. I think that, I, I know for a fact that, um, that they both at least started in no fee and royalty only. And I think, but you have to, you know how good you have to be to be able to do that? And well, yeah, I mean, I good. worked for uh, Rodell for about 10 years contemporaneously with Ben Savenga and Schwartz, and they were getting paid in their, in their royalty compens and incentive compensation deals, and I was getting a flat fee, mm -hmm. which was a very good flat fee at the time, but they, I just was not, you know, I wasn't at their level. And uh, if I'd mm -hmm. said, uh, I want to be paid from a royalty, mm -hmm. a royalty from now on, uh, they probably said, well, you might want to think that over, Richard. That's, that's what I'm doing now, by the way, is just, it, it's, I, I haven't written for clients for years and I started writing for clients again. And I, I just, I said, I'm going to remove all stress. So I get no money up front and a, a good stiff percentage if it wins. And it's just, I go in and I tell them I'm only going to write for about two or three days and I'm going to edit. It'll be, it'll be 90% of what I used to do, but it'll be 50% better than, than anyone else you, 
you you have writing for you. Yeah. So if I, you know, just, you know, in this, you know, I, I take a week to write a piece, you know, and uh, blowing the competition away. So I wish I'd caught on to this a little earlier, but removing that stress of getting paid up front was what did it because I, I am maxed out on stress. I think we have a lifetime um, container of stress we can have. And once you, once you max out, it doesn't start to go down. It's just, you, you got to play with that level. And I'll do anything to reduce the level of stress. So the idea that um, I, I won't accept a deadline and I won't accept money and I'll get around to writing it when I want to. I still write it sooner than the guys who want two months to write a piece. And I'm writing a very complicated, very, uh, very uh, competitive markets. So just, just throwing that out there. Richard. Yeah, and then, and then the other thing is um, when you throw in the fact that since you have no stress and it's all about the royalty, the as pieces as rock. You control, yes. you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna do all the updates, and you're gonna, yeah, like you're, you know, you're gonna beat yourself before someone else beats you. Exactly. So, and that's a that's an important consideration. It's one of the things that Ben Savenga and Rutz uh, prided themselves on. I mean, Ben Savenga, like once he got a control, he never let it go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you weren't gonna find somebody to beat him because he was gonna beat himself. You know, one thing about Jim Rutz, it's funny because, you know, we, Deutsch and I and Brian had a whole session on just talking about Rutz. Yeah. <clears throat> but he was different than Ben Zavinga. I worked with both of them. I ghost wrote for Jim Rutz for a couple of years, learned how to write like him. And the advantage that Rutz had was he didn't give a shit what anybody thought about him or his ideas or anything. He did not care. And Ben Zavinga actually cared. Ben Zavinga is a very caring, generous in, individual. I'm not saying Rutz was a sociopath, but he, it was the first time I got a glimpse of how to adopt a sociopath's um, uh, demeanor, which is something that Richard, of course, has tapped into very good with his book. Um, and learning how to do that, how to not care. I, you know, I, like I say, I was an empath. To not care is like, it's like horrific for me. But I put on that hat when I start writing. When, when, I'm, when I don't have a deadline and you didn't pay me any money, then screw you. I'm going to write what I want. Oh, and the other agreement is they have to mail what, what I write. They can't change it. They can test against it, but they can't change a word unless there's a legal problem with anything I say. So, so and, that, and that it, idea of not caring, my writing zooms to another level because if I if I owe somebody a deadline and they paid me money and stuff it kicks in and I'm writing for the client at that point and that's the wrong way to write we should be absolutely free to write whatever the hell we want because we're going to do the right thing well I have a what almost a 40-year career uh, Richards is at least as long and uh, Brian's I think yours is even longer even though you're younger than I am so anyway had, had to get that out yeah no but right. and, and, and Rutz um uh, you know, he, he, um, he didn't, not only didn't care, but, you know, then yeah, he, he did have to go through a certain, uh, uh, editing process with him because he also, he was kind of a hermit. So he <laughs> didn't understand societal norms and politically right. correct wasn't something that he understood. He and, was a bull in a China shop. That's yeah. A bull in a China shop. John reminded me of another regret, Jeremy, and that is that I spent m m way too many years worrying about what the client would think rather than what the customer would think. Ooh, that's that's client, I, used, I used to think, if, if only I make the client happy, then, I, then everything will be just fine. <laughs> so as a result, I became like the king of, of, of copywriters who, uh, who uh, have written copy that the client thinks is absolutely wonderful, thinks can't lose, fantastic and gets out there and bombs. I mean, I've written so many of those over the years. It's just, it's ridiculous. And it all stems from thinking that the customer, I mean, that I've got to please the client rather than trying to, you know, speak directly to the customer. John, you talk I, about I, this I, with I, Tony I, Robbins, actually, is you said, you know, you've lost and done a horrible job when the, when the boss thinks it's good. Oh, yeah, I want I want my clients staying up late at night, <laughs> unable to sleep when it's going to drop tomorrow. And they don't, oh, God, my life's over. My wife's going to leave me, and I I, I want to I want them completely. And I had a I lucked into a couple of clients who said we will do that. We'll take the leash off you. We will mail everything. That's how they got me to work for them. Uh, we'll mail everything you write, and we'll take the heat. And I and I said okay, you, but you guys, if there's a legal problem, let me know. But other than that, yeah, and they they. 
they they glorify in the stories about not sleeping for three days, waiting for that uh, four page ad in Golf Digest to come out with the one legged golfer ad. I mean, they and you know they're they're all happy about it. It's all funny stories out, but it was deadly serious back then. It was affecting their health. And my answer to that is, you know, don't be a client then. You know, it's, it's right. a rough game. This is. This is NFL football. You know, this is uh, – there's no crying in baseball and direct response. So, You know, one of the biggest things I think in my life that I've found to be probably the most valuable um, thing in, in any aspect, whether it's business or health, is, is a mentor. Um, and it shortcuts the process. And I, I know all of you feel that's, that's probably when you look back um, or now, that's – the most important thing um, in, in experience and just um, kind of leaping and time collapsing things. So I wanted to talk about each of your favorite mentor stories uh, for a second. And John, I want you to start with, I thought it was really interesting how you kind of broke in um, with Jay Abraham oh, yeah. Um, yeah. early on and, and then any other mentor stories, but start with that one. All right, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, basically, I went into <clears throat> freelancing because all my other options in life were shut off to me. I kept getting fired from jobs, and I, it was one shot. I had like a month's rent paid and enough, you know, gas for for you know to fill up the car one time, and and I went out, and all I had was uh, John Capel's book, Tested Advertising Methods. Um, and I went out there and I discovered uh, Claude Hopkins. So I, I read Claude Hopkins. I liked it so much. I read it again, my life in advertising and scientific advertising, read it again and read it again and kind of made a habit of reading it and was getting my jobs in the Los Angeles Times one ads and saw an ad for a writer and they wanted uh, a little packet of stuff and a little uh, story about, you know, why I should be in direct response. And I sent it to him. It was Jay Abraham. And he sent me back my package and said, you know, you're obviously not suited for the kind of writing I want done. Uh, my advice is you go read Claude Hopkins. And, and that was Jay. It was obvious he hadn't looked at my stuff at all. So I found out he lived in the town next to me. He li- I was in Hermosa Beach. He lived up in Palos Verdes. I found out where his office was. And that afternoon, I drove up there with the intention of hitting him. I was going to, my, my, my fantasy was him opening the door and me punching him just like in the movies and him reeling backwards. But I got intercepted by the, uh, by his uh, manager at the time, I forget the guy's name, but he kind of ran the office. He called me down, we started talking and I uh, wound up working with Jay. And it was one of the great things. I, and by the way, talking about getting paid, I, my deal with Jay was I would, do writing for him and show up and kind of be a a road dog as as needed in exchange for free run of the office. They never paid me a cent. And uh, that free run of the office I got, I got to sit in the back of the room while Jay was doing these, um, these uh, 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 consultations, live consultations. Clients would fly in from New Jersey and sit down. They'd wonder what this guy sitting in the back was doing. I'd just be back there soaking it all in. And Jay would Jay was into his uh, uh, he would uh, do uh, uh, lifts. Uh, uh, he had a bar in, in the office, and he'd actually be doing his lifts by fifties uh, while talking to the client. And he'd spit as he'd go, and he'd, the client would be sitting there with spittle on his glasses and afraid to remove it. It's just you know this 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 legend is like giving him an hour of his time. And I, I learned how to do consultations. I learned how to do hot hot seats from from Jay. It was just great. It was just a, um, a wonderful thing. And it was much better than the fantasy of, you know, opening the door and smashing him in the face. But, and, you know, I, I think he admitted uh, over the years that he never looked at my stuff and he tended to do that, to get, get things rolling and then not follow through. That was one of Jay's things that I didn't pick up. I tried to follow through and stuff. But, boy, what, a, what an advantage to have a, have a mentor like that. And a lot of other writers, Scott Haynes, was another writer who took um, who took my thing of working for Jay for free and did it. Uh, I think David Deutsch actually did it too a little bit. Um, it was a great little tactic. I I don't know where I came up with the tactic. That's but what it, I was going to ask. What made you even? Most people would that wouldn't even cross their mind. You know, I didn't want to blow it. I had this sense, and 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 all of this was connected through Claude Hopkins, who had been dead at that time. Brian for what fifty years in, in the eighties. Yeah. Um, uh, it, 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 well, what's it like? It's like walking into a big party 
and and overhearing someone talking about Captain Beefheart, and suddenly you know you've got a connection there. And what are you willing to do to further that connection? And for me, being a social retard and an introvert and all of that, I would put on my extrovert hat and pursue this person who talked about Captain Beefheart because that happens to be you know a passion of mine. Uh, that that absurdist uh, rock and roll stuff, Frank Frank Zappa and uh, the Fugs, um, and I would I would get over my bad self to do whatever I had to do to further that conversation. Now I may not go anywhere. The guy may have been making a joke or something, but uh, with Jay it was like, wow, I don't want to I don't want to tempt fate. I I will do whatever I have to do. And Jay was I sensed that Jay was not going to turn down a deal like that. You know, he probably would have paid me too, but that would have changed our relationship. Like, you know, this, you know, taking jobs for no money up front and no deadline. It just changes the relationship. I, I, I don't know where that came from. There are, I think all three of us, or Jeremy, I'm assuming you too, we have some kind of hidden power within us that we can't tap. It's maybe it's in the, the amygdala, maybe it's further up in the, in the modern slab of brain that we have, the prefrontal cortex, but it's, it's advice. And if we tap into that, it's the same stuff like, you know, I got from uh, David Ogilvie to, to start taking naps, fill my head full of stuff, take a nap, wake up with a headline or, or the big idea. And it's never failed me in, in 40 years. And I, I don't know what it's tapping. I, I, I have a vague idea, but I don't know exactly. So yeah, I'm t- it's, it's like all of us, you know, uh, I think all, you know, when you're in a long-term relationship, what made you think she was the one? You know, and what made you get past your own bad self to actually propose? What actually happened? A lot of us can't really explain it. We just knew. And, and there's just no rational explanation for it. Yeah. Especially 20 years later when, uh, you know, you're, what the hell I'm going to come back to you, John, and I want a, a favorite Gary Halbert story. Um, Brian, um, mentor, I know you've had a lot of mentors. I don't know if, um, if you want to mention a few and then maybe a favorite story. Yeah, well, the, you know, the, I have a, an expression that, you know, you don't, you know, that you don't choose your mentors, your mentors choose you. Hmm. And that was always how I did it. And again, I don't know, you know, it's similar to what John's talking about, but it, it, it's something that um, I, I kind of, when I, when, I, when I found somebody that I really wanted to have in my life and I didn't know how to do it, I basically figured out what did I have that I could give them for free. John figured this out too. But in my case, since I, in the early part of my career, I became a list expert. Um, and the people I wanted to gravitate to were either, you know, marketing experts or copywriters or whatever. So in two cases, both in, the, in terms of Gene Schwartz and Dick Benson, they both were like, you know, savants when it, when it came to everything but lists. And so I said, you know, in both cases, in different, in different uh, environments, I said, you know, uh, Dick, you know, you've got the, these newsletters that your list broker is giving you all the wrong lists. And I was mailing all the right lists at Boardroom. And I basically said, you know, I'll give you whatever lists you need and I'll tell you what to do. And Gene Schwartz, because he was exchanging copy for names, I then found other names that he could mail. So in both cases, and, and what they gave me in return, I didn't ask for anything. But when I was then consulting with Benson, the kind of consulting that he did with me went above and beyond. Like he would, you know, and I didn't ask him for this, but he would treat me like like a son almost and making sure that I got as much out of the meetings and as much out of the, the knowledge. And as far as Gene goes, you know, Gene used to invite me to his apartment, uh, which was like a museum. And, you know, I used to get a, a tour of the art and then just got be able to sit there and eat lunch with him and just, you know, soak it up. And I only got that, I think, because I gave him a hundred zero in terms of giving him as much list knowledge and information because that's what I had. And so I guess the lesson is every, we all have something that we can give. So if you can contribute to anybody, especially someone who you want to be a mentor, 
you may get lucky and you know they're gonna they're gonna recognize that and then give it back um and then in general i i just i think in 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 a you know just a very simplistic way i just always respected my elders as i said before so when i found an elder that i wanted to get their respect and i wanted to learn from i just you know sat at their knee and shut my mouth mm. and that goes a long way it was a lot of the stuff in richard's book on persu- you know on on persuading people to do what you want them to do you know um one of them was you know ask questions one of them was you know make a positive impression one was i mean i have a bunch of them here but it's the magic word you know it's and it wasn't just being a glad hander it wasn't just being a flatterer um, you have to be sincere about what you're doing so that you're not conning them. But, you know, people want to hear, you know, what you have to say. And you got to have something to offer, too. So I really tried to put my best foot forward as much as I could. I mean, I was, you know, 25 years old and they were 60. So they had a little more experience. But I tried to, you know, cultivate what I could. And I got a lot of mentors to choose me. And that was one of the in looking back, I don't know, I, again, I didn't know why I was doing it at the time, but now I look back on it and I've got, I've got this uh, incredible um, array of, of, uh, of mentors that were created by this, uh, you know, this way of being. Has, has anybody approached you, Brian, to mentor them? Yeah, you know, like when I get the thing, will you be my mentor? I, you know, I don't pay much attention and I try to give them a lot of reasons why they can do certain things. But I, I the Jim Rutz product, you know, we're going to, we're going to be launching that soon with, and that's the one that uh, John said, we did a video with me, John and David Deutsch. So I went out in my, in my weekly blog and I said, oh, I did a blog about Jim Rutz. And then at the end I said, you know, Jim's sister gave me all of his his swipes and all of his his work and i'm going to put together the giant you know read this or die the the lost files of jim rutz and i didn't even ask for anybody to help me with it and three copywriters out of my list said i've always wanted to learn about jim rutz i'd love to work on this Mm. with you not asking for money not asking for anything and those three guys um, they just are, stepped up. You know, what's that? They just stepped up. They just stepped up. They yeah. they said, "I wanna, I wanna do, um, I wanna work on this," and they've worked on it with me. And they might make some money on it still, but they weren't doing it for the money. And all three of them, I would say, are my mentees, whether they like it or not. I mean, they they ingratiated. They did to me what I did to a lot of other people, and I wasn't being conned. I knew exactly what was going on, but I loved it. I, I loved it because they were sincere and they're genuine. And um, now I've got these three cubs that I don't even need them because I don't do copy cubs because I'm not a copywriter. But I've got these three guys who are going to be, uh, you know, my students and. And uh, it's it's pretty rewarding. It's really good. Um, Richard, all of you go in a second, but I want to stick on that for a second. You know, um, what you said, Brian, and, and John mentioned this too, which is like, <clears throat> it's showing up, it's adding value, and it's not really asking for anything. And um, right. you talk about, you said a couple of times, I didn't ask for anything, 100, zero, and you talk about it in uh, Over Deliver, which I'll show. Someone told me once, I don't know if it's true, if you show the book, it sells more books on video. So oh, really? I have the book, I tend to show. I don't know if that's true or not. But um, Over Deliver, you talk about it. Did you, um, you know, did, did someone teach you that or did you just, um, it was inherent um, in, you know, not asking for anything. Yeah, you know, and, I, and it's I, hard to do, I guess, it's really hard to do that and then expect nothing in return. Right. And I don't know if I, you I, can just talk about I, that for a second. Yeah. Like, how do you do that and then really genuinely expect nothing in return? Yeah. And I, I feel think the same the way, way I did it. I, I fell into it. I mean, I, I, I didn't, no one taught me to do that. But then 
after a lot of years of doing it, I saw a lot of other people do do it. And so I think the, the, the it, you, can, you may not get a, a return from the one person that you just did something to, but if you look at it as a cumulative contribution to the world and to everybody that you're doing, something's going to come back. And so if the one thing that I contribute to you and all of a sudden John or Richard comes back with something else that wasn't a function of that, I attribute it to that. Or, or I'm, I'm being simplistic here, but it's serendipitous. It's sort of, you know, just keep putting positive karma in the world and shit's going to come back. And it may not come back from the person that you worked a lot harder on than someone else, but I really believe that. And, you know, again, it's the accumulation of doing this for 40 years that tells me that it works. Now, the downside is there are certain one-on-one -on -one relationships where I gave so much and got virtually nothing, and that's okay because I got so much overall. Why do I have to be greedy about, you know, what I've gotten um, from one person when I've gotten tons of shit from, you know, hundreds of people. So that's kind of the, yeah. the way I got around it. Yeah. But I, when I went into the, this theory, it was just, just being, just give, just contribute, just give. Then it turned into a hundred zero and then it turned into this serendipitous, um, you know, it, 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 it goes here, but it comes back here yeah. and that's fine. Yeah. And I don't keep score. And Adam Grant talks about this in his research a little bit with give and take, which is you can be careful of who you give to as well. Yeah. You know. um, Richard, what about you? Mentors, a good mentor story. Well, I've got three of them. I'll go through uh, pretty quickly. Uh, one, one was a fellow copywriter and a teacher uh, and two were clients, which is interesting. Um, the uh, teacher was Milt Pierce, who was one of the most prominent copywriters of his day, which is uh, roughly when I was getting started. And he gave the very first class ever offered at any major university in the country on direct mail copywriting, and I took it. There were only uh, 10 or 12 of us, of us in the class, and one of the other students was none other than Mr. Robert W. Bly. And so Bob Bly and I have been friends for close to 40 years now as a result of that because we both took Mill Pierce's class. Mel Pierce taught me a lot about the basics of copywriting, and even more importantly, he taught me the business of freelance copywriting. Then the other two were just clients who were also copywriters. They got into the business of copywriting. One was Kay, Kay Lautman, uh, who uh, had a, uh, was a copywriter, but she started her own agency, and it was a fundraising agency. She taught me uh, the business of direct mail fundraising or how to, how to uh, uh, write fundraising letters. Uh, she's she was the author of probably the best book ever written on that subject, which is called Dear Friend. I'm sure it's still available on Amazon. And then the uh, third person, also another client, who just again happened to be a better writer than I was, and as a result taught me a lot. And that's uh, Don Smith, who was president of uh, Belvoir Communications. Uh, not a name that's as well known as uh, Brian's Boardroom. Uh, interestingly enough, they're only about a couple of miles away from each other. Uh, but Belvoir Communication, where, whereas Boardroom built its uh, business on uh, large consumer magazines with big circulations, uh, Belvoir built its business with little niche uh, publications in a variety of different fields. Uh, they must have 30, 40 plus newsletters, and they vary on everything from um, uh, owning an airplane, to uh, how to take care of your pet, to uh, how to compete in horse, uh, horse, uh, um, what are they called, horse shows, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I spent an awful lot of my career working directly with Don at Belvoir, and he taught me so much. Um, he's just a better copywriter than I am, and I learned so much from working with him. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, mention my competitors because uh, I have been fortunate, I guess you could say fortunate, 
either either fortunate or terribly unfortunate to have competed against the very best in this business for a very, very long time, uh, particularly when I got started working for Rodale. So I was competing against Gene. I was competing against Gary. I was competing against Jim Punkery, uh, a, a name that's perhaps not as well known as the other two, but just, in my opinion, just as good. Um, other, you know, the best copywriters in the world. And I was competing with them on a daily basis and studying their work. And uh, there's uh, really, uh, there's no better education than that. Mm, yeah. Um, so I want to discuss each of your books. And John, first, I, you know, we can't end this without telling a good Gary Halbert story. So um, we'll start I with think that. Yeah, I, I think the best one was when I stalked him. What I met him at at uh, Jay Abraham's uh, divorce party, and uh, you know he was arrogant and dismissive, <laughs> and I liked him immediately. And uh, he had just started his newsletter, so I stalked him, and I finally got him to ask me to come come aboard. I mean, I I started going to some of the little events he was he was giving. I just per, you know I I was very prolific. But yeah, come on board. I'll pay, and we'll do this. So one of the first meetings we had at the 9,000 building on Sunset Boulevard, right up from the Playboy building or across from the Roxy, well, I, I, brought a, I brought a pad of paper. We were going to sit down and do an hour of hardcore um, uh, 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 talking to clients, writing for clients, doing big idea stuff. I sat down. Right as we sat down, he had three secretaries at the time. They all burst into, the, into his office. I mean, the printer was down. The landlord was on his way up with a serious problem. Um, there were a couple of mad clients on the phone, all this stuff. It was like, it was like chaos. So I just, I kind of picked up my stuff and put it back in my briefcase. I thought this meeting's over. And Gary just got up, pushed them all outside, closed the door, locked it and sat down and said, operation money suck. And while chaos happened outside, we just calmly went about our business, calling and doing the stuff that brought in the money. I've never forgotten operation money suck. That's your number one job. And magically, when we were done, about an hour, an hour and a half later, we opened the door and everything had been solved. Somehow they'd figured out the printer, the landlord was gone. It wasn't such a big deal. And they, they calmed down the client. You know, they just, it was kind of like throwing the corporal, you know, into the trench saying, you're in charge now, you know, when he's always taking orders himself. It's like, just, just do it. And we, you know, happen, he happened to surround himself with very, you know, powerful women who, you know, just needed a chance to do it themselves. So. No. That was a that was a huge lesson. Hmm. Um, so I want to start with your book. Um, you have multiple books, but um, I want you to talk about the Entrepreneur's Guide to Getting Your Shit Together, Volume Two or One. What should people know about uh, Volume Two? Okay. Well, first I want to say how pissed off I am, and most of the other writers I know are at Richard for actually having taken that goddamn novel in the bottom drawer of his desk and, and published the damn thing. So, and doing a really good job of it. Um, so, you know, I, I have my novels and it, all of us do. And, you know, congrats Richard for doing that. So thank you, sir. To move, move laterally into the, um, um, into the fiction world. So, uh, my books, um, the entrepreneur's guide, I, I, I've written a number of books. What, I wrote Kick-Ass Copywriting Secrets of a Marketing Rebel in 14 days because I had to have it ready for a, uh, I think, a Dan Kennedy seminar I was speaking at. And, uh, <laughs> I've got a number of other books. You can find everything in my, in my blog, john-carlton.com, just to be vain about it. But the for starting about 2001, I think, or maybe 2002, and going for something like almost 90 issues. I did a monthly newsletter that was very expensive and only went to the A-list uh, in, in direct marketing. And uh, so nobody else saw it. I just poured my heart and soul into that newsletter. It was an eight, eight to 12 page uh, newsletter that went out of just me ranting. It was called the Marketing Rebel Rant. Um, and I did rant. I would pick a subject and just go off on it. And uh, then I stopped. I, I can't remember. It was either 2008, 2010. I'm not sure. But it was timeless stuff. The, the age of the newsletter didn't matter. I realized I should probably pack these together into a couple of books. So I picked the best. Uh, each of those books is over 350 pages long. So mm. there's, I don't know how many newsletters, but I turned the newsletters into chapters. I did some editing. I added a few things from my blog and uh, basically put out these two volumes uh, which are essentially 
rejiggered uh, newsletter um, uh, issues uh, going a little deeper. Uh, so it was just, it, it was just really fun to do the revisit all of that stuff. You know, I, I decided to make my career an, a, an ongoing autobiography. So all of my stories, and it, you, you either like it or you hate it. So if you go on to Amazon, you look, there's, there's a number of people who really hated it. Uh, this is awful stuff. He just talks about himself. And, and then there's the people that get it and they become kind of rabid fans. So that's that's the story of the book. Um, it's uh, uh, I meant it to be a guide, but not so much. The, the second volume actually has some checklists of uh, have have you know the checklist of how to become an entrepreneur, how to hire a writer, how to be a better writer, things like that for any kind of entrepreneur. But the idea of it being a guide to entrepreneurs is is a little broader. It's a sense of it's not do this, then do this, then do this, and and you got a business going. You know, put up a website. There's plenty of that stuff out there. This was the deeper stuff when you clear away the the uh, the stuff on the on the surface of the pool and you go to the deep end of the pool. This is where this stuff comes in. You're going to encounter it at some point. Often, if you're unschooled in it, you'll encounter these lessons and not realize you're encountering it until later. And if you miss them, uh, you're not going to become as, as good as you could. So this is, this is starting at the 80% of being an entrepreneur and taking it to 100% where you're as, as good as you're going to be and, and you're much deeper. You know, with, when uh, guys like uh, Brian and Richard and I and Deutsch and all the other guys hang out together, we often have to wait until the rookies leave the room before we tell the good stuff. Um, that, that's always been the case. That's why they talk about the, the one place to be. If you're going to go to an event like a seminar, the place to be is the bar because that's where the writers and the, and the real movers and shakers are going to congregate at some point. And if you can just maneuver your way to listen, you probably won't be in the center. You may have to be sitting somewhere and pretend to be involved in something else and overhear this stuff because we don't, we can't talk about a lot of the stuff that we talk about because it shocks the rookies and outrages the outsiders. So I call them, you know, there are two kinds of people in my, in my world. There are the insiders and then there are the civilians. And when you're around the civilians, you can't talk like I do to the, to the insiders because the civilians don't understand. Again, they're, they're insulted, they're offended. And so this, these, this book, the entrepreneur's guide to getting your shit together is a compendium of those insider conversations and if you as you'll see on uh on amazon when occasionally a civilian will come across the book and buy it and and just be outraged at this stuff but the insiders all get it so yeah thank you john um and i know you have to hop off but i wanted to to get to that <coughs> and where can we point people? i want to hear what richard and Brian is <laughs> where can we point people to online to check out more um, to your well, the, 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 the one stop sh uh, shop for me is john carltoncom That's Got my it. blog. Yep. You, can, you can get a hold of all the courses and stuff. The Fantastic. simple writing system, uh, kick ass copyright secrets of marketing rebel. And there's God, it was 14 years now. I started the blog in 2003. It was one of the first marketing blogs out there, and it's all free. So there's 14 years of archives to access. Of, of some pretty awesome stuff. I usually only post once a month, but I've been doing it for 14 years and there's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, there. amazing. John-Carlton.com, check it out. Um, Brian, I have over-deliver here. I was speaking at Perry Marshall's event. I get off, um, I start chatting with a few people. I spoke and people came up to me and said, you know, because uh, I had your book in one of my slides and like, you know, three people read it on the air, airplane over to his event. Um, and, um, at love the, the hundred zero concept and everything like that. And so thank you for writing this. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, a few concepts in the book, but, um, and it's hard to pick which one, I don't know if you have a, a favorite, if, if you don't, I will, I'll choose one. And, um, well, I, I guess, you know, when I, when I think about the book and it's, it's, it's basically, you know, uh, my my career and so I I did it for 40 years and now I want to teach it so um, and so you've got you know there's a chapter on over deliver there's a chapter on original source there's a chapter on how paying postage made me a better marketer there's a chapter on RFM a chapter on 
creative, a chapter on offers. So it's all of that. Yeah. And the last chapter is uh, playing the long game. Yeah. And that kind of brings it all together. Um, and when I mm -hmm. look at my career, I, you know, all the, all the, all the things, I didn't invent anything. Um, I just know that I, here's a concept and here's how I applied it. And if I can tell my story around it, I think it's a great way to get people access to some concepts that they might not get access to had they not been around to learn things like RFM and lifetime value and 40, 40, 20 and all those kinds of things. But again, I didn't invent anything, yeah. but I put a good story on it. Yeah. But the last I like chapter, you're saying, you know, Brian, I don't know if you came up with this, but I've heard you say it is Facebook didn't invite didn't invent lookalike audiences and it comes back into yeah that's you know, you're saying the original. same thing about this stuff right yeah Which is, you I, didn't invent it yeah and it's not like you know I, and I'm, I'm clear about not you know taking a stroll down memory lane but to the reason why you want to learn original source is and be able to apply it to what's state of the art today that's going to make you better at, at state of the art today you could still be good at anything in, in, in marketing today, but I think if you have some foundation in direct response principles, it'll only make it better. So I think that, you know, the book serves as my way of being the bridge between the, the, the fundamentals of direct marketing and everything that's state of the art today. And again, the last chapter is playing the long game. And that's a series of, 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 concepts and basically that is the umbrella around my entire career so i think those are the things that bring it all together in terms of you know a hundred zero and and mm -hmm. and uh, uh uh you know the the dinners i do and and the the kinds of networking things that i've done in my career the the the, the reason why you've got to be consistent and always be the same person all the time because you never know who's watching or listening. And yeah. so that, I guess that's the chapter that brought it all together. But the book is, is, you know, is, is really a, a combination of, it's my second book. The first book I did was more of a, a primer on, you know, direct marketing through the eyes of, you know, six legends of direct marketing. But this book is really my, you know, my opus. I, I don't, I don't know that I'll do another book. I don't have a novel in me. Um, this is kind of it for now. And so what I did was when, while I was doing that, I created a site at overdeliverbook.com that honored all my mentors so that all the people that, you know, I have a, I have a Jay Abraham course and all, and some keynotes. I've got, you know, Gary Bensavanga's bullets. I've got, you know, uh, a swipe file of, of mailing pieces going back, you know, to the, to 1900. Um, I've got um, Dan Kennedy, a swipe book from him. I've got two classic books of direct mail PDFs of, of Dick Benson's book and Gordon Grossman's book. So what I did was I realized that my mentors are not going to be remembered uh, if I don't remember them. So by by mentioning them in the book and then putting together this this resource site, that was as much fun as writing the book. So basically, you go to that site, you 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 go off and buy the book uh, through that site, come back to the site, and you get access to uh, eleven bonuses that are outrageous. And so I over delivered on the bonuses so that it would be consistent with the book. It so is the best package of premiums ever put together to promote a book, in my opinion. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard other people say that, too. But it's probably, you know, and, and some people say, oh, it's too much. And I said, well, you yeah. know, it, well, I, you never can have too much. And, and yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. It, it, so anyway, overdeliverbook.com. Mm -hmm. People can go there, get, they, they'll buy the book, and they'll get as much in bonuses or more than, than the book itself. Yeah. I mean, I'm tempted really? to, which I won't do out of respect for, for all your time, but like 
uh, one of my favorite cha- one of my favorite chapters, chapter five, is offers. And you you know the first quote is the right offer should be so attractive only a lunatic would say no. Claude Hopkins and um, you mentioned so many things. Um, so I, I was tempted to like I want to get John's and Richard's <clears throat> thought on offers, which I won't do right now. But um, I mean, you do mention here, like Richard said, premiums, and you also just don't know what will hit. And uh, John, you talk about this too with when you're talking about bullets, that sometimes you would write 10, 50, 100 bullets because you just don't know which one is going to jump out at someone, right? Right, and, they're, so. and, they're, and their entry points into the, into the package or into the promotion, and by having all those entry points, you're, you're, you're guaranteed to, you know, to, to, to make someone vibrate. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So anyways, thank you for writing this. It's still my like my anal self wonders why this got smushed into the side. And I want to like, you know what you've got, I, I don't know why you don't have the hardcover. That's, that's, that, that's okay. the, so that, that's the galley. Um, I like the galley. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyways, thank you. And um, I want to talk about how to talk anybody into anything. Right. Um, and the Don con and I was reading, you know, I always love reading the, um, not even the book, but the initial part of who writes, you know, what's, what they liked about the book. Cause you could really see, um, the who's who, you know, Brian, you have this and, and Richard, you have this, um, you know, Dan Kennedy. And I get to the last one and it's, um, John Corcoran, my business partner's father who actually wrote, um, this last one. So that was, that was a bit shocking. I was like, okay, that's interesting. But um, how to talk anybody into anything and um, con, our, con our to secrets. And I think you were talking about switching this to being a bonus on your book. So oh, you don't get it for free. You have to buy the book now, as of right now. To oh, get oh, no, no. Right, right now you get it for free. I was just oh, chatting okay. with Ryan about whether I should change that around. But right. To, 44 just, con our secrets. Um, and so I figured we'd talk about a few of them. Um, okay. Is there anyone that would? Well, that you think know, John or, or John can, I or this can I interrupt for just a second, John? Yeah. I want to I want to say something about my colleagues' books here, and this is not just to make sure that John stays on the call. But, uh, <laughs> oh, but flatter uh, flatter him and will st- flatter him and will stay on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's that's my thinking here. This book, that in my opinion, there are three books that take like a an overview of the entire industry. Three uh, great books. Uh, the View from 30,000 Feet. That, and it's not an easy thing to do because it's a very complex and big industry that involves a lot of moving pieces. The, those three books are uh, Successful Direct Marketing Methods by Bob Stone. The second one just called Direct Marketing by Ed Nash. And they're both classics, absolute classics. And this is the third one right here. And what it, it's not only as good as those first two, but, and Brian touched on this, the thing that makes it different is that it helps make that transition from the paper and printing world to the world we live in today. The, you know, if you buy successful direct, uh, successful direct marketing methods by Stone or a direct marketing by Nash, you're not going to find anything in there about the internet or email, VSLs or anything like that, all the realities that we have today simply because they were written so long ago but this book not only matches theirs in wisdom um but it it helps us you know helps bring the business business into the 21st century and this book by john carlton ah, actually, this this book actually reminds me of my three favorite books of the old testament uh proverbs ecclesiastes and the song of solomon which were all written by solomon the wisest man in the world and this really is just accumulated wisdom over a long, long period of time of working on the front lines with, with both small and large uh, clients and uh, fighting the battles and just all the things that John's learned over those years. And there's just so much, to soak, so much pure wisdom to soak up uh, from this book. I absolutely love it. And now we'll talk about the important book. Which uh, which one did you want to ask me? About? I wanted to, was I was curious of which out of the con artist secrets would there be any that John or Brian disagree with? Uh, well, you you have to first make the point that uh, that copywriters are not con artists, and 
the difference is something that the law, it's a, it's a principle that the law recognizes, and that is criminal intent. Mm. Con artists have criminal intent, copywriters don't. Con artists basically want to steal from people. They do it in an incredibly clever way, but they basically want to take your money and get out of town. Uh, copywriters, on the other hand, not only want to give you a product that's worth as much or maybe even more, than the money that they're asking for. But they really do want to start a long-term relationship with you because one of the fundamental principles of our business is that you usually either lose money or at the very best you break even on with your first product. It's when you start selling product number two, three, four, and so on and so forth that you start to really make a profit. So the last thing you want to do is make somebody feel like they've been cheated or that they've been ripped off or anything like that. So that's the big difference. Having said that, we use very much the same techniques, almost exactly the same, same techniques. As far as what they disagree with, I don't know. There's some, there's some things in my book that don't necessarily apply to copywriting for the simple reason that they have more to do with persuading people in person rather than in print, like the concept of mirroring people, for example. Uh, if you notice that you, you're, uh, um, the person you're talking to is crossing their legs, you cross your legs. If they're throwing their arm over the chair like that, you, you throw your arm over the chair like that. It just helps create a bond of, of trust and, uh, um, well, the word that uh, John used, empathy, uh, between two people. And there are a lot of tips in there that uh, I, I shouldn't say they can't be applied in copywriting, but you have to, you have to do a little thinking to, to realize how they could be applied in copywriting. Well, but talk they, about, you know, Richard, um, you know, there's a few of my favorites. There's one is don't change minds, validate emotions. So oh, yes. I want to talk about that. Absolutely. The last thing that you want to do as a con artist or as a copywriter is attempt to change somebody's mind about anything because we, we, we have very deep commitments to the, to our own opinions and our own thoughts about things. So we, we don't want to have somebody prove that we're wrong about anything. We want people to tell that, tell us that everything we've ever believed in, in our whole lives is true. So the whole game of copywriting and con artistry is to use the opinions, the beliefs, the, the facts, the thoughts, the, the, the myths, if you will, the, the history of that person and use them in such a way that it, that it triggers a, a, a response. It's not to change their minds about anything. You want, in fact, you, you really want to take advantage of their emotions. The three things that you're looking for in, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a customer or, or a mark, as a con artist would say, are number one, intelligence. You don't want stupid people necessarily. You want intelligent people because only intelligent people can grasp the opportunity that's being presented to them. The second thing you want to look for is people who are highly emotional, people who are lonely, who are angry, who are aggrieved about something, who feel cheated, who are sick, emotional about one thing or another. And the third thing that you're looking for is impulsivity. You, you don't want the kind of person who, uh, you know, calls a friend before they make any big decision, who goes and researches every car on the market before they buy a car, who makes a long list of pros and cons. That's the last kind of person you want. You want somebody who believes in their own judgment and uh, has made a few good calls with their gut in the past. They're very proud of that and just considers themselves to be a very good judge of a character and a very good judge of new opportunities and likes to act quickly. You put those three things together and you've got your ideal customer or your ideal mark from a con artist's point of view. <laughs> and then scarcity and rarity. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, this is a principle that's really well known to copywriters. And uh, I, I, uh, in this booklet, I had to... Uh, I, I had to write for two audiences, which is usually not a good idea, but I had to, I had to, I knew that a lot of the people reading it would be copywriters and this would be very basic to them. But I also knew that a fair number would be people who are not necessarily interested in advertising, but they just want to become more persuasive either in their business or in their personal lives. And uh, scarcity and rarity, the mere idea that you, that you can't have something makes you want it. So badly. I mean, I, the, one of the stories I tell in the book was once years ago, 
I was on my way to Macy's to do some shopping and my wife said, uh, um, is see if you can get a board game called Trivial Pursuit. And I said, what, what, what do we want with a board game? We've never even played a board game. Why, why do you want a board game? She said, well, everybody's talking about it. I think we should get it. It might be fun. So I went to Macy's. I did my shopping. I, I looked for the, the Trigo Pursuit. I couldn't find it. So when I got to the counter, I said, uh, I need to get this board game called Trivial Pursuit. And he, the guy said, you and everybody else, man, yeah, I can put you on a list. <laughs> so I went across the street to Gimbel's, had the exact same experience. Next thing you know, I'm going to every store in town looking for a board game. To, and, and it got to the point where I would, you know, support any friend, oppose any enemy, <laughs> do anything I could just to get my hands on Trivial Pursuit. And if you examine my behavior, in the morning, I didn't even know what this thing was, and I had no idea why anyone would want it. By the evening, I would do anything in the world to get my hands on it, and, and that's just because it scares me. Yeah. Um, so where should we point people online to find the book, The Don Con, and, and check out more about the, the Con Art, Con Art of Secrets? Well, it's very easy to remember. It's uh, thedoncon.com. Uh, and uh, when you go there, you can get um, you can get uh, the book uh, "How to Talk Anybody Into Anything: Persuasion Secrets of the World's Greatest Con Artists" for free. All you have to do is give me your email address, and I'll send it to you. It does take a few minutes, by the way, so be patient. Uh, <laughs> my uh, my hope is that once you get there, uh, you'll uh, be so charmed and tickled by what I have to say about my own novel that uh, you'll buy the novel. But uh, downloading the uh, book about con artistry and persuasion is absolutely free. And there's only two copies left of the free version. <laughs> <laughs> two exactly. digital copies. Right. <laughs> sold out gimbals. Only sold 10 out. people are allowed to put their email in and get it. So <laughs> if you're not one of those 10, you better go now and check it out. Um, thank you all for uh, doing this. It was an absolute pleasure to be a fly in the wall of this conversation. And um, we will link up all the sites, all the books, and um, anyone listening should um, make it a point to get all of these. And I've studied all of your works um, for hours and hours. So I appreciate what you guys do and what you uh, share with the world. So thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. <laughs>